Uh, thank you very much, Janis, for this very impressive speech. Uh, it was uh, a very clear analysis of the Eurozone crisis. Uh, uh, you know, as you told us about some uh, absurd things that have been done to address the crisis and didn't solve the crisis, I agree. And then uh, you came up with your own proposal about solving this crisis. So this is all very neat, I have to say, uh, and uh, I'm sure you know this, uh, when the words creativity and central bank come together, uh, people here in Germany get nervous. But uh, I totally agree, you know, that there was a lot of creativity, uh, you know, going into crisis management, and the question is, uh, you know, how, how helpful uh, was this uh, creativity? Now, um, we have time for discussions. I have, like, you know, 10 questions uh, on my <laughs> own, but I don't want to uh, monopolize this. Uh, you know, may maybe I just start with a question to get us going, but you're all invited to, uh, you know, make comments uh, or ask questions, and there are microphones in the room. Let me start with one question. I think, if I understood you correctly, one of the assumptions you made was that this internal devaluation you described, you said, in principle, you know, if prices were perfectly flexible, uh, you know, we could manage a, a currency union and we could have had a devaluation, uh, you know, let's say in, in Spain or Portugal, uh, to adjust the crisis. But if I understand you correctly, you're saying, you know, internal devaluation, you know, you lose, a country loses its competitiveness, prices go up, you know, wages go up, everything is too expensive. Uh, and then, you know, if prices and wages were flexible, you could just, you know, say, okay, you know, we cut wages by 10%, whatever is necessary. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we address the crisis. And you're saying, you know, it's not... Uh, it's not feasible in the currency union. Now, I, I think people from the, uh, you know, as you call it, populist establishment would say, look, uh, somehow uh, in Portugal, in Ireland, in Spain it worked. It didn't work in Greece, but, you know, they, there's always this, this example of these countries where people say it worked. So what's your, your answer to that? Well, firstly, on the, th on the theoretical level, and then I'll talk about particular mm -hmm. countries. Look, on the, the theoretical level, the, my point is, Twofold. On the one hand, if you have uh, large price cost margins in a place like Germany and also sectors, capital sectors in particular, that don't exist in a, in a country like Greece, however much the wage falls in Greece, Greek cars will never become competitive with German cars simply because you don't make any. Yeah? So that, that, okay. Secondly, when you have these price cost margins that are so different, or highly oligopolistic in one country, perfectly competitive in another, not because it's competitive, but just because it is non-tradables and, you know, we produce souvlaki, right? Uh, and you can't have a large profit margin on that. What this happened, what this causes is an accumulation of surpluses in the banks of the surplus country. And those, di by definition, will flood into, during the good times of a monetary union, into a deficit country because of the interest rate differential. The, uh, deficit countries starved of funding, so interest rates are higher, whereas the lake of, of, of liquidity in Frankfurt is pushing interest rates low. The Frankfurt bankers will want to... And also, countries like Greece, remember that, uh, were extremely ac attractive to Frankfurt bankers because we had very low levels of private debt. So the Greeks didn't have much money, but they, had, they owned their own home, they didn't rent, so they had assets, and they had no loans, a, a, a banker's dream. So you had this flood. This flood creates, because you don't have a competitive economy there, you may have low price cost, cost margins, but you don't have a competitive economy, you don't have a capital goods sector, that money goes in there, and all it does is it inflames and inflates asset prices. That creates a false sense of wealth, as I was saying. People get credit cards, that creates, uh, they take more money, they buy more BMWs, uh, Everybody is happy, but this is completely unsustainable. Then Lehman Brothers happens, goes all boof. Now, internal devaluation, why doesn't it work? The internal devaluation does not work. In Greece, we had a 42% reduction in wages. You can't have more. I mean, you can, but I mean, it's enough. <laughs> and yet, there was no pickup in investment. There was no pickup in economic activity. Exactly the opposite. There's still none, whatever it, the, the media may be reporting. Uh, the reason is very simple. The one thing that does not devalue is debt. Prices may go down, wages may go down, but by the way, prices go down much more slowly than wages. Because unlike in the economics textbooks, we don't have perfect competition. 
we have, even in Greece, we have super, the supermarket sector is highly oligopolistic. So when wages go down by 40%, prices go down by 10%, so you have a massive reduction in aggregate demand that the internal devaluation model of perfect competition does not take into account. But even if you forget that, private debt and public debt do not devalue. So you have a country that remains bankrupt and gets more bankrupt as, it's, as the internal devaluation process uh, proceeds. Right? Okay. That's my theoretical answer. Now let's move to Ireland, to Spain, and to Portugal. They're very different countries. Let's see how much of a success story each one of, it, of them is. Just one theoretical question. I mean, you could just write, write off the, the, this debt, right? I mean, you could say, okay, you know, you've That's why I was elected. Easily, as you said, you know, and so, you know, if the banks yeah, don't but we didn't, did back, we? they lose it, and, and there you go. But we didn't. Instead, we did that. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> that was my point. I got elected. Okay, so I had think... one, one objective when I was elected. One object, a debt restructure and a reduction in tax rates. That's it. If I could do uh, clemency. That's the main issue for you. Okay. If no, I could have done that, to, I would have resigned yeah. happy. Yeah, yeah. No, I right? think, you know, I, I think, you know, most economists would, would agree. You know, I mean, if you have, uh, you know, this kind of, uh, let's say, debt, debt bubble, uh, the only way out of it is a restructuring of the debt. You know what the tragedy was? Everybody agreed. Wolfgang Schäuble agreed. Yeah, yeah. He did. Yeah. But, you know, I think, of That's course, why he wanted Brexit. You know, you, you, I mean, the, the pretension was, uh, you know, we'll somehow, you know, nobody will lose money. And, uh, okay. No, no, of it course. Was political. Of course. Uh, are there, but are there let's now talk about, if you want me, I can yeah. talk about Ireland, Portugal, and Spain. Yes, maybe a few words about okay. how, how you assess these countries. Ireland is a divided society. There are two Irelands. There is the real Ireland, which is, remains depressed. If you look at, you know, the, 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 those who are not connected to the offshore economy, to the Facebooks and the Apples and so on, the Irish who remain in old Ireland, they remain just as badly off as they were 10 years ago. And the discontent is massive. But of course, Ireland is a tax haven for, you know, they are piggybacking, they are free riding on you, on us, on the rest of us, by allowing Apple to get away and Facebook by paying 2%. Thanks. Well, that, and it's a small economy, so if you have 25% increase in, uh, in GDP. They had 25% increase in GDP one day. You should, a, a, an alarm, alarm bell should ring there. Let's go to Spain. Spain is another interesting example. Look, Spain had, did much better in, than Greece for a very simple reason. They had very little austerity. Because what the Rajoy government and my friend Luis de Guindos, his finance minister, managed to succeed in doing, they managed after our bailout and the, Italian, the Portuguese bailout and the Irish bailout, they managed to have a, 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 a memorandum of understanding, a bailout, only for the banks that did not involve harsh austerity. And you know, he, he told me that. Luis Donguido said to me that this was my objective was to avoid the kind of austerity and internal devaluation that you had. The okay. growth that we see in Spain today mm. is problematic, Clemens. You know, as a German, you should be worried about it. You know why? because it's fueled by private debt. The same dynamic that we had before 2008 in Spain, we have it again. It is not investment driven, it is private credit driven. Uh, driven. So there's something to consider there. Portugal, Portugal collapsed in 2011. There was a massive reduction in living standards, in economic activity, in investment. The program worked much better. It's still, you go to Portugal and tell people that things are good here and you see what they tell you. But, I mean, look at the massive exodus of Portuguese who live in London, who live in, in Berlin and so on and so forth. They have not gone back. But things are far better than in Greece. Why? Two reasons. They were included in QE, whereas Greece was not included in QE huh? from the beginning. And secondly, this new government immediately after our government was crashed in 2015, managed to negotiate a kind of an interesting deal with the Eurogroup. And it was this. We will not undo previous austerity, but we are not going to introduce new austerity. Had Greece not introduced new austerity in 2015, and it's introducing new austerity every month, we'll be doing this next year as well, more internal devaluation. We would be doing as well as Portugal, if not better. So the point I'm making is that internal devaluation is not the way out. But they didn't, I mean, they, you're saying Portugal is fine, so... I didn't say it's fine, I said it's okay. better than us. Okay. It is okay. bad, really okay. bad, and Greece. Okay, okay.
Okay, but you would you would would agree that um, somehow you know this mixture of rescue programs and management and monetary policy stabilize the country like Portugal and do you think it's sustainable? So no. is the problem solved? You don't think it's sustainable? No. You would say Spain is unsustainable? Portugal I think the whole Eurozone is unsustainable. Okay. I think this country is not sustainable. You cannot have a country where everybody is in surplus. The corporate sector, the household se se sector, mm. uh, current account surplus and the federal government in surplus. You are being forced to take your money and give it to foreigners you're entrusting your savings onto foreigners who cannot be relied upon to look after it while you are not investing in your own country. I don't believe this is sustainable. And I think that Germany and the people of Germany deserve better than that. Very clear, thank you. Uh, any comments or... Please. Yeah, Andreas Peichel here from the IFO Institute. Um, first of all, thanks a lot for the, for the great and stimulating talk. And, um, I would like to follow up on what you said that uh, ideally you would love to have a federation in Europe, something like the United States of Europe, yeah. but you think it's not realistic. But don't you think that if, uh, if Merkel and uh, Macron would go to this press conference and say, look, uh, we plan to have the United States of Europe in maybe 10, 15, 20 years, and now we need to do some steps, and then we, we do all the things uh, that you did, that this is something that a lot of people in Europe would still laugh, and despite all the problems that we currently have. And remember the, the United States of America, they, they were created uh, with, basically it started with a trade war between the now US and England, and now we are in a trade war with the US, so we could use this war and use this to create the United States of Europe. Of course, we don't need the, the civil war or independence <laughs> war afterwards, but what do you think? Well, I'll start from the last point. Remember Alexander Hamilton? He's now a um, famous musical as well. Common debt. Huh? This is not something that resonates well in this country. <laughs> but move away from America. Look, uh, I agree with you. It's a question of uh, presentation. Would I like them to, go, to start talking about federation? Probably not, because I, we do not... You see, people out there have had enough of Europe. I'm saying this as a Europeanist, because when they hear Europe, what do they think? My pension fund is being crushed by the central bank in this country. In Greece, ah, my pension is gone. That's what they think. Europe is, my pension is gone. It's like the word democracy in Iraq. It means bombing, that the Americans will bomb you. That's what democracy in Iraq means. There's nothing wrong with the concept of democracy. There's nothing wrong with the concept of Europe, except that they've given it a bad name. So first, we need to improve the image of Europe. So I would prefer to have this press conference first without talking about federation, to change the climate so that we can then all want to have this discussion. But look, I'm, I would be quite happy to have that. Other questions? Over there, yes, please. Can we have the mic? Thank you very much. Uh, I found it very interesting what you said about green investments and I'm very happy as a woman to hear about this that finally in energy sector there is some kind of movement towards green energies. Uh, would you, could you tell more about it? Yes, I, thank we, you. we need to end fossil fuel extraction and use and we need to, f to create the technologies, both the ones we don't already have and devel develop further the ones we have. Uh, in a massive kind of Manhattan project where we concentrate Europe's best scientists and technologists and engineers and we fund them well to get us out of this conundrum of having a, a, a wonderful continent which nevertheless needs increasing quantities of energy that it cannot provide for itself without destroying the planet or depending on Vladimir Putin. Right, so, and even aside of the climate change, uh, do you think that it's economical? I mean, I see that it's the cheapest energy production is, for instance, solar or wind. So we win and we can keep up, up with technology in Europe and not stay behind Asia. Absolutely. Look, the, Japan the Chinese are going to do it. They are already doing it. In a few years, they will have done it. We are falling behind. We are falling behind in Europe when it comes to green energy, to artificial intelligence, and uh, of course, battery technologies. Yep. Yeah? We are falling seriously behind. 
And this country that has such engineering expertise and excellence should be funded in order to participate in the process of developing these technologies. You know, I think that 500 billion is the, le the least we can spend every year on this. Okay. And we have it. It's slashing around in the financial sector, sector doing nothing, except damage. And then more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, are there other comments or questions? Over here, please. My name is Matthias Fink. Thank you very much for your reassuring title, especially to the Germans in the audience. But um, I'm asking myself whether we should not, in addition to what you said, whether we shouldn't have some kind of internal transfer mechanism like we have in Germany between the different federal states. Now, Bavaria, as we all know, runs a huge surplus and pays all of Berlin's debt every year and some other uh, federal states' debt too. And even while we are moaning about it and complaining about it all the time, and it's also testament to our strength, and I think like secretly we like the way this, this has been going on. So is this not something that, at least on a certain level, we also need if we move towards a federated Europe of some kind? Of course. Thank you. Of course. But it, remember what I was saying in, terms of, in the context of the article by Nicholas Calder, that this Euro crisis is creating centrifugal forces in Europe, pulling us apart. You know, the Germans hate the Greeks, the Greeks hate the Germans, everybody hates the French. <laughs> the Italians uh, want to be French, the Portuguese don't want to be Spanish, you know. Uh, and it's very difficult in this environment to create a federation. That's why I was trying to imagine the press conference that will start the process of getting us together. To those who say that, yes, but we're not a demos. We are not, we don't have, there is no such thing as Europe, European identity. My answer is, there didn't used to be a German identity. There didn't, there didn't used to be a Greek identity, the way we have it now. Uh, we assume that it always existed. We built our identities through common action, through getting closer together, through actions that highlight the extent to which we have synergies and to the extent to which our interests are in common. And especially in a world in which you have Donald Trump on the one hand, you have Vladimir Putin on the other, you have a Middle East which is a cesspool, and you have the uh, demographic changes around the world that will ensure that we're going to have lots of migrants to this, to this continent. I'm, and what I'm saying is that we better learn how to welcome them and to help them strengthen this aging continent. But all this requires political action, and this political action needs to be underpinned with sensible economic reforms at the level of Europe. We, we slowly need to come to an end. I, I would like to, to conclude with, an, with a question related to Italy. So in a way, you could say Italy is in a situation which is not too dissimilar uh, from the Greek situation. So they have kind of stabilized in this crisis, but no growth is coming, they are highly indebted, and the new government is opposed to the European, let's say, establishment. So my question would be, uh, you know, if, if you now were the Minister of Finance of Italy, how, how do you, would you get at it? And, and related to that, maybe, you know, how would you do it, and what's your prediction? So what is going to happen uh, in Italy? How will they run it? Well, my criticism of uh Matteo Renzi, the, the last elect, uh, yeah. uh, uh, prime minister who had some kind of real majority and a political persona, mm -hmm. uh, representing the Europeanist side of Italian politics. My criticism of him was that he wasted his political capital. Instead of coming to Brussels or to Berlin and saying, folks, these rules can't work. Can we sit down and rethink them together in a collaborative way? What did he do? Like a spoiled child, he was going to Brussels demanding his right to break the rules. So the same thing. Huh? Because the moment a German hears an Italian saying, I want to break the rules, the German freaks out, quite understandably. Yeah? But that doesn't mean that we should carry on imposing this kind of pretense of rule following. We should do... So what would I do if I were Matteo Renzi or the, the current finance minister? I would go to the Eurogroup and I would say, Italy is unsustainable. 
We want to stay in the euro, but here are some ideas of how we can sustain the, in the euro, which actually reduce the costs of managing this crisis for everyone, like the ideas that I was coming up with. I think this is the collaborative approach. Those who make these kinds of reforms impossible are the real aides, the real helpers of people like Salvini who want to blow up the European Union. And one last comment about Italy. Italy is caught in a similar kind of trap as Greece, but it's very different to Greece. Indeed, Italy is a country that has no peer in Europe. No other economy is like the Italian economy. The nearest I can come in comparing Italy with any country would be Japan, an industrial country, net exporting, with a serious demographic issue, shrinking population, aging population, with very high public debt and very low private debt. What happened, and, and of course I forgot to mention, zombie banks, banks that can't function like proper banks, they can't lend to the private sector because of, of, of past misdemeanors and crimes and insolvencies. But in Japan, the reason why the political establishment did not collapse, why the country is not in the state in which Italy is, why Japan is not a threat to the global order, unlike Italy, the reason is that in Japan, the treasury is borrowing as if there is no tomorrow, and lending to the private sector, and infusing aggregate demand into the private sector. And the Central Bank of Japan invented quantitative easing, and is still at it. Uh, so Im imagine Japan with the Maastricht rules. It would be a basket case now. This is what we're doing to Italy. So we need to, to, to reconfigure that. Italy can stay in the rules if we Europeanize the management of public debt and of the banking system. Okay, now I have to say Japan is maybe, you know, with its debt level, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, too sure that this is exactly the way we would all like to go, but, uh, you know, I uh, should, we, we should con conclude by thanking you very much for this outstanding talk. Uh, thank you very much, Yanis, and uh, come back soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yanis. Thanks for the meeting. Yes. And let me let me thank you all for being here. As usual, there is a wine reception next door. Thank you. <laughs>